cancels that condemnation and gives us life. Romans 8.1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Acts 16.31, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Verse 6, therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. As long as we're here, away from the Lord, we can be confident that we will someday see him face to face. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. Our faith is not having seen Jesus Christ face to face while he was still on earth, but it's based on his promises and on the indwelling Holy Spirit. For now we must live by faith, not by sight. We long for the day when we no longer have to deal with this old flesh, the sin nature, and the devil, but will be home with the Lord. You know, when I was a missionary kid and, and thereafter, I long considered Palau to be my home. You know, we all have our earthly homes where we long to be. But when you become a born-again Christian, your citizenship is in heaven, not on this earth. Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that we can disobey the laws of the land and the authorities, but it does mean that where there's a conflict, our obedience has to be to the Lord. Philippians 3, the nations and leaders of this earth. When we truly, truly realize where our citizenship lies, we then begin to yearn to be at home with the Lord. Because we know that our home is with the Lord, we then will be motivated to please him and do what he asks of us to do here. No matter what the circumstance we are in, we'll find a way for it to bring glory to the Lord. Someday, we're all going to appear before the Lord and answer for what we've done and how we've lived in him. The judgment seat of Christ is not the great white throne judgment. We've already been saved, so we're no longer condemned to hell, Romans 8, 1. But we all will face the Lord to answer for what we've done and our motives. The Lord will then give rewards for what was truly done in obedience to his will. The gold and silver will be separated from the useless materials. 1 Corinthians three twelve through 15. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burnt up, he will suffer loss. He will himself be saved but only as one escaping through the flames. So the judgment seat of Christ is not about salvation. All who go there are born again, and that can never be taken away. But apparently some will receive a reward and some will not. We know this as, of course, various crowns, which we don't know the true significance of. But someday someday we will. 
There seem to be rewards given to all who overcome set forth in the letters to the churches in Revelation. Let me remind you of those. Revelation 2.7. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The paradise of God is the third heaven. Revelation 2.11. He who has an ear, let let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Revelations 2.17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Revelation 2.27. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. And Revelation 3.5. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. And Revelation 3.12, him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him, my new name. Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, the wonderful thing is, some people think, oh, those are for the different, each one is for a separate church. But Revelation 21.7 says this, he who overcomes will inherit all this. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. So we inherit all those promises if we're overcomers. You know, we have a lot to overcome these days. We need to be able to overcome and not be overwhelmed. Revelation 21.7 indicates that anyone who overcomes will be given all the benefits due to every overcoming believer. But, you know, there are also special rewards given, some of which are listed as crowns. There is the crown of life in James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10, which is likely given to all believers. But there's also the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8, and the crown of glory, 1 Peter 5.4, which may be rewards for those who have gold and silver left over when all their other post-salvation works are burned away. So what are we supposed to be doing? We are given the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 11, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. What What we are is plain to God, and I hope it's also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we're out of our mind, it's for the sake of God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So because of the fact that Christ will judge our post-salvation works, we ought to be busy persuading men to come to Christ. God knows what we're doing and what we're not doing. Our job while we're in the flesh is to continue to spread the gospel and then disciple those who have believed. Paul says that he's not trying to brag about what they're doing, but what they are doing for the Lord is evident. And they should take pride in what he's doing and follow his example. 
If it seems like Paul is out of his mind, it's because of his radical stand for the gospel and for the truth. If Paul seems composed and sane, it's because he wants to help those who have already believed. Paul's whole experience is taken up with convincing people of Christ's love through his death and resurrection. Because of what, because of what Christ did, all those who truly believe have died to sin and are alive for Christ and in Christ. Those who are truly dead to sin in Christ no longer live for themselves, but they live for Christ. We live for our Savior and Lord. Verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. And though God were uh, uh, making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's be uh, behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. An amazing thing. True believers do not regard people from a worldly point of view. This lets out many fall a worldly perspective anymore because we now have the Holy Spirit as our teacher through the written word. There are false teachers who live in the old creation instead of the new one. Only God knows if they even have a new creation with them. But sometimes I suspect they don't. Otherwise, they would know the difference between truth and error. You know, God reconciled us, and therefore he, pa he passed on this ministry to us as well. We are to bring people to the Lord. Only Jesus Christ can reconcile a man to the Father, but we can preach the gospel and give men the opportunity to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God didn't count our sins against us when he accepted our faith and placed our sins beneath the blood of Christ. Therefore, we need to be careful to reconcile people to God regardless of their sins. You know, sometimes great sins kind of cause Christians to shy away from presenting the gospel to certain people. But since God gives everyone an opportunity, regardless of past sins, when they are repented of, we must follow Jesus' example in this. I remember a time where I was doing a concert series through the islands of Micronesia. And I went first to the island of Yap, which is the closest to Guam. And I did a concert out in the village. And I actually brought a video projector with me. And I sang a couple of my songs with video backgrounds. And one of them was about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it had some very graphic images of it, et cetera. Well, at the end, I, did, I felt like I needed to give an invitation because the gospel had been clearly presented. And uh, I remember this old guy coming forward. There were a number of people that came forward, but I remember him in particular. And so I sat down with him and witnessed to him and, and uh, he wanted to pray, you know, that the Lord would forgive him. And so we did that. And uh, I was so happy to see. I mean, he was so happy about uh, being born again. And after he got up, a, a person from the town and from the church came to me and they said, do you know that he was a town drunk? <laughs> well known for being a troublemaker. And this guy came to the Lord that day. Well, that can happen when you're preaching the gospel. 
The amazing thing is that God has given every believer the ministry of reconciliation. And that's the way God makes his appeal to sinners. Those who claim salvation apart from being witnessed to by a believer may be in error. I'm not saying a person can't come to salvation by reading the Bible, but God's primary method of reconciliation is through a born-again believer witnessing to a sinner using the word of God. Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then can they, they call to him on whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him if they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they're sent? That's why it's so important to be about the business of reconciliation through the preaching of the gospel and not get off on some waste of time like, oh, we're going to take over the world for Christ. We're going to save the planet. Or we're trying to get do spiritual formation through occult prayer techniques and yoga and all this other kind of stuff. Waste of time. Paul reminds the Corinthian church of what is the main thing which is what we have a tendency to lose track of in these days that we live in. You know, it's not a light thing to remember that God uh, made him who is a sinner, who is not a sinner, to be sin for us. In that light, we ought to be eager to spread the good news. The good news includes the message that because Jesus Christ paid for our sin by taking our sins on himself, we can become the righteousness of God. Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Romans 10, 15, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's what we all should be doing, bringing good news to the world, to whomever the Lord has brought us to, whether it be a family member, or a co-worker, or anyone else that the Lord leads us to witness to. So we should be doing that. We should about be about the Lord's business. Well, I want to thank uh, everyone on uh, on live stream today, and those of you who's, who've joined us on uh, on Zoom. I invite those who are on live stream. Come to the Zoom. You get to meet some great people. Um, I am going, I, I have, 